Good morning. Hello, everybody, and thank you all for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are from. Looking forward to another stream today. So with that, let me pop the map on the screen and see where everybody is joining from today. Got a bunch of people in the chat already, it looks like. So, and I think I saw John Barker from here to record in here. Thanks for joining. Hello, Simon from the UK. Hello, Stanley from South Africa and Carlos from Spain. Awesome, good to see everybody here. So things are getting uh, put together a little bit better in here now, and I'm back to my desk and I've got my hair light again, so that is looking a lot better now. And yeah, it's coming together nicely in here. At some point I will do a proper studio tour, but in the meantime you're getting a little snippets of behind the scenes peaks while I am working on it still. As always, today we'll just be chatting about whatever you want to chat about, doing Q&A on the ATEM Mini or live streaming or whatever it is you want to talk about. And I'm here to answer questions, talk about how I'm using this, this stuff and what I'm doing. And yeah, that's the plan. So if you do have a question for me, make sure you mention my full name at Aaron Parecki in the chat, and that makes it show up nice and big on my screen so I can make sure not to miss it. Oh yeah, that reminds me. Something really weird happened with YouTube last week. I don't know exactly what was the cause, but you may have noticed that YouTube was telling you that I had a video that I streamed 51 years ago. So that's cool. I didn't know I was even that old, much less being able to live stream for that long. But I'm going to go for a new record, I guess. Try to beat 51 years now. Yeah, so what happened was I the, the show I scheduled for today, last week, that one like disappeared from my dashboard, except in some places. And then some people were seeing that it had been streaming for 51 years. And it was like gone from my page. It wasn't upcoming. It wasn't archived because there was no video content there. And like, as far as I could tell, there was nothing I could do except make a new schedule, a new stream. So the one that you're watching today, hopefully, hopefully you're not stuck on that one wondering why it's not starting. Uh, the one today is a new stream that I scheduled and it looks like we're working fine now. But that also meant that like the email went out twice because it still looked like it was upcoming, even though it was not quite. Anyway, long story short, that was a giant mess. I don't know what happened. It's definitely YouTube's fault. I didn't touch it. So, yep. Um, anyway, sorry about that. Hopefully it doesn't happen again. Who knows? A little weird ghosts in the machine. So, yeah. 51 years ago, for those of you uh, paying attention, is... Get the chat up here. Uh, oops. I forgot, to I forgot to switch the tabs I'm casting. Ignore that. The, um, the 51 years ago is 1970, January 1st, 1970, which is Unix timestamp zero. And yeah, somehow that stream ended up getting marked as having been streamed already, but with no date. So yeah, pretty Pretty weird, pretty weird for sure. All right, let me, I see, uh, see a, uh, a couple of questions here. So let me go ahead and uh, take a look. Yeah, the email notification was because one of them was for the sort of dead stream. Is the M5 stack working? It is, I'm not using it today because I'm here and it was actually more useful at the desk, but now I'm back on the stream deck, so I push this button, you should. Come on. Great. Go. I don't know why that's not working. One second. That one gets that one. Really? Come on. My wireless camera stopped working. Great. Well, I was going to show you what I'm looking at here, but that's going to be a bit of a challenge if I can't get my wireless camera to work. There we go. That one goes over there. That one. 
let's go back to the camera and back here. There we go. Okay, this is what I'm looking at today. So the uh, I like using the Stream Deck better for controlling macros when I'm looking at this this desk, and um, rather than the M5 stack, which is useful for when I'm not at this table with access to this, it's for when I'm over at the other table. And I am still planning on using it for when I am back over there doing those shows. So yeah, the the streams from here are when I'm doing you know these kind of Q and A streams, and this is also where I do my workshops from where I actually need to be demonstrating stuff on my computer screen. So I'm sharing my screen usually through Zoom uh, and then my camera. And I'm doing like the countdown timers and stuff. Oops, echo it on the audio. Where is that coming from? I think I just turned it off. My input, oh, I hadn't turned off the, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. My let me go back to this one. So you can see my okay, focus. Stop. Stop doing that. My multi view here. This says hyperdeck because this one is where the countdown timer plays from, which is on this hyperdeck. And this is where the music comes from. So I have to have the audio routed through that one. And then I apparently forgot to turn off the input, the audio input on this. And uh, when I switched this input four to be routed to this camera instead of the HyperDeck, uh, I had the audio on. So you were hearing me through this little camera and my microphone. So it was probably bad audio from that camera and d d the delay was different. So sorry about that. Uh, still, again, getting used to this setup. But this is why I've, this is why I'm using this thing because it means that I can reassign input four to something different. So I can right now, like I've got my, my input two is my computer screen. So I can share my screen onto the stream if I wanted to, but I can also be like, actually input two, I actually want it to be the camera from that desk. And now it's the overhead camera from the other desk. And that is why I, uh, why I'm using this thing and also means that things are just a little bit more complicated to manage now. So hopefully I won't make that mistake again. Okay. Take a look at some more questions. I was having a problem streaming to YouTube yesterday for my mini pro Facebook and caster both worked fine, but YouTube would never connect any ideas. Why? So the fact that Facebook worked, Anything else work means that there's no network problem. So that's that's the first thing I would I would assume is that the network configuration wasn't correct. The fact that those did work, that's great. That means there is no network problems. So at that point, I would just double check the URLs. So Facebook, if you are uh, if you are not using the built in uh, the built in YouTube platform, try that. But you could also manually make your own config to um, set the URLs manually, but the default one should work fine. Streaming key, that's it. Um, other than that, like if it's still not working, then it's probably just like a temporary glitch in the matrix. Echo, echo, sorry, echo, 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 feedback somewhere. Hopefully not feedback, hopefully just an echo. Um, okay. Now that we know you are VR animation, it figures why you know so much about the A10 Mini Pro. Thanks. What is your opinion about using OBS as a downstream key or lower third graphic source? I've tested it and it works great. I think it's a great option. Yeah, there's uh, two ways you can do it. You can either, well, so I rather would stream from the ATEM, streaming from hardware, but using OBS as a graphics generator is a lot less work on the computer than actually encoding the stream and processing all those video sources. So that's how I would do it. Of course, the other way to do it is to feed your ATEM into OBS as a webcam and have OBS do the streaming. But using the using OBS or frankly, any other any of those other kind of um, streaming streaming programs like Ecamm or uh, H2R graphics as a source for generating graphics, then you feed that into the ATEM over HDMI. And I think that's a great option because it basically means that your computer is doing a lot less work and then you just 
key it out in the ATEM, probably using the um, the downstream key, Luma key, to just remove the black from the image, kind of like I'm doing with this chat. And I think that's a great option. What format do you use to record to the HyperDex Studio Mini? I have variable success getting videos to show up. Yes. It's very, very, very picky about video formats. So the trick is the deck itself has to be set into the format that you are writing files onto the card exactly. So if you are creating files at ProRes 422, make sure that the HyperDeck is set to that format and not something else. Otherwise, it won't find the file. So that's sort of the weird, the weird, uh, the weird thing there. But I normally just do ProRes, regular ProRes 422 uh, or four or the 444 with the alpha channel. So I can do uh, alpha graphics over it if I want to. And that one usually works fine for me. And I see a super chat from Angelo. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. What is a new 3D printer and how did you come to that choice? Excellent question. Uh, for anybody who's been following along with my YouTube stories or on my Instagram account, then or my website, I've been posting some sort of behind the scenes photos of various things I've made with a 3D printer. And I absolutely love that I can just be like, oh, I'm trying to connect this thing onto this thing. I need a bracket of a certain size. And like, there's no way I can buy one. So I can just design one, whip one up in on my iPad. 30 minutes later, it pops out of the printer, and now my, what was the thing I just mounted? The, oh, the Hollyland transmitter on top, or receiver on top of the monitor arm back there. I don't think there's enough light in here for me to show you. I have all the room lights off right now. The, but yeah, that, it's been a lot of fun. So I have been, I've used a 3D printer that like friends have had in the past, almost, I would say probably like seven or eight years ago. And I was like, always scared of them, always a little bit like, I don't think I want that level of responsibility <laughs> in in my life of like having to maintain that kind of hardware. And it was always very finicky and very picky. And I, I just kept putting off like actually taking the plunge and buying one myself. And I just kept finding things that I wanted to be able to print lately. And I was like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna finally do the research. I feel like it's been long enough that the technology probably has gotten better. And what I found was that is absolutely true. I've heard a lot of good things about the Prusa printers. Not sponsored at all. Uh, but yeah, I've heard a lot of good things about Prusa's Prusa printers from friends. And I went with the Prusa Mini, of course, because everything has to be small here. So the Prusa Mini is the one I ended up with. It's sitting back there. You can't see it because there's no light in here. But it fits on that shelf. And the... Mm -hmm. The reason I got it was because I heard a lot of good things. It seems to be one that they've they've put a lot of hardware in it that like make it sort of self self regulate and and a lot of good like it's it's um, dust flying around. Um, there's a lot of good like hardware in it that makes it just a lot easier to use and a lot more is automated and I'm okay with that. Like I don't I don't want to get into three D printing to like absolutely understand everything about material science. That's not my goal with it. I just like to be able to design stuff and make it appear. So that felt like a good balance between like it's it's a good company. It's they've they've automated uh, quite a lot of it, but not so much that you feel like you are buying something that's sort of too far into the automated automation side. If that makes sense, where I don't I wouldn't trust something. So like inkjet printers are a good example. Like when you buy an inkjet printer, you think zero about how it works and why. And it just works. And that's great. Like that used to not be the case, right? But now the inkjet technology has gotten so so good and cheap that you can just buy an inkjet printer off the shelf for like $30 and buy some ink and it will work. And I don't think 3D printing technology has got to that point yet, at least not at the price point I'm willing to spend. So if you do find something that's a little bit more packaged up like that, like I'm still skeptical of that. And that's why, that's why I went with the Prusa because I felt like striking the right balance there. Um, anyway, that was a long rambling, rambling story about the printer, but it looks like people agree. Prusa, great company. One of the best printers you can get for that price. Yeah, it is. it was very affordable, frankly. Um, 
it was just at the right amount of money that I was willing to spend on it, and it has been working great. So, yeah. Thanks for the super chat. All right, let me scroll back up and see where I was with the questions. And again, if you do have a question for me, make sure you put at Aaron Parecki in it, and then it shows up on, on my screen highlighted. Can you explain ATEM control on ATEM mini and what it is designed to do? Love your content, thanks for your help, thanks. Um, ATEM control, uh, the, is that what the, that's the ethernet port. That's what the ethernet port is called. And if you plug it into your network, you can control it from multiple computers or without plugging in the USB. So for example, right now I do not have the USB plugged into the ATEM. I'm controlling it over the network. And it is, uh, it also means I can control the other ATEM over there. And that's also how I can use the, uh, the little wireless, things I've been making on, on streams, uh, little controllers, which those are on the Wi-Fi and they talk to the ATEM directly. So yeah, it's meant to be a, a way to control it that is uh, where you don't have to use the USB port for the control. Here's a question. Can you have a different lower third on each camera input in the ATEM Mini Pro ISO? So not exactly. There is one downstream key. That's what's that's what is doing the the last overlay in the chain. So my my camera is like the background layer, and then right now I'm actually not using the the middle one, the upstream key. That's what you'd use to take out green from a green screen or uh, things like that, where you can scale video like picture in picture. I have a picture in picture button. So the upstream key is doing the small picture in picture, and then the downstream key is the last layer. And there's only one of those in the ATEM. Actually, most of their, you have to get, you have to go really expensive before you get multiple downstream keys in these devices. But that is, it's think of it as like there is a layer, and then you can put stuff into that layer. So what I'm putting into that layer right now is from the Chromecast, where I can. You can see that this is where, this is the Chrome tab. This is where it shows up in the ATEM, and then it's cropping. And then it's taking just that part and putting it over here and then removing the black. So you can't have like different ones for each camera. They don't get assigned to cameras. They just get put into the program, but you can swap it out when you change camera angles. So if I had a, if I had multiple graphics loaded up in my ATEM, I could the, I, I could make a macro, which would switch the graphic in the media pool, and then switch camera angles. And that would totally work. So that's probably how I'd recommend doing that. And uh, it would take a bit of work to set up. So I don't think I'm going to, if we have time at the end, I can actually go through and try that. But you'll have to remind me because I absolutely will forget. It's very encouraging to see someone so knowledgeable sometimes not getting it working straight away. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. That was a second camera mic. Okay. That's a good question. How much of your streaming expertise do you leverage in your day job at Okta? Have you held any internal trainings on remote video conferencing? So uh, what I do is I, I use this stuff for hosting my training myself. And I do, that is most of my job is doing several hour long trainings on software security. And I definitely don't need like this much stuff to do that, right? Like I can do it with a webcam and a computer. But what I have found is that I often want to go just a little bit farther with it and make it a little bit, give people a little bit more of a, of an experience. Cause I'm doing this for like outward facing things and, you know, public events and things like that. And it lets me do things like bring in countdown timers and then, um, also doing, doing, we, we do some streams with, with others about, you know, Q and a thing, Q and a sessions. And that's where I use Streamyard. Um, for, for that. And, uh, we also have like a lot of my other coworkers do a lot of that stuff as well of, of presentations internally and publicly. And I would say like, yeah, like definitely using this stuff a lot for, for my job. 
And we, I haven't done any like actual trainings internally, but uh, about video conferencing, but I, we do have like a wiki page internally that I've documented stuff on as well as a, uh, a Slack channel dedicated to just talking about video tech. And I help, I help all my coworkers set up their rigs and like recommend cameras and lights. A few of them have the G7 that I'm using for this and, um, a bunch of us got A10 minis to be able to use it for that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Christopher asks, what would you do if the main speaker coming in from vMix call is down to seven FPS for both audio and video? What would you do? That's a tough one. How long do they need to be talking? I guess if you're like in the middle of a session and their quality just drops, well, I'm curious what the audio sounds like because audio isn't really measured in frames per second. Uh, and it'll, it'll usually end up just switching to other bit rates and sounding tinny or like a phone when they need to drop the audio quality. So I guess it would depend on like how long they need to be talking on the stream for. If, if you know that you have another 30 minutes of them, I wouldn't want to subject people to seven frames per second video and tinny audio for 30 minutes. But if it's like, they're only gonna be talking for like two more minutes, I would just let it roll as long as the sound is passable. If they start sounding like they're underwater, then I would cut it immediately because sound people will tolerate bad video, but they're not going to tolerate bad audio as demonstrated by everybody immediately telling me that my audio had an echo as soon as that happened. But if like suddenly this happened and you just like stop being able to see me, you can still hear what I'm saying, right? So yeah. How is the ATEM mini quality wise to OBS for live streaming? As far as quality goes, there's a lot, there's a couple of factors there and it's, I, the, 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 the differences are, I think more important in other ways than quality. So you're going to get good quality from both and the differences are going to be what you can do with them. So the, uh, like with OBS, it's actually a lot more flexible, right? Cause you can bring in more graphics in more different ways. You can set up scenes that are more complicated and it's great for that. It also then requires a really powerful computer to do that well, if you have a lot of video sources, whereas the A10 mini, you can just use without a computer at all if you want to. And, uh, and then the other part of that is the reliability. And, and that's where I, again, prefer the A10 mini because I trust it to do its job more than I trust my computer to not crash. So, Quality wise though, like you can get good quality out of both for sure. Great question. Love the evolving studio episodes. Uh, is there a way to use stream deck with two ATEMs? There absolutely is. And that's actually what I'm doing right now. So if I show you my button config, let me get my computer back into the stream. There we go. So yeah, the, this is my, my com stream deck config in companion. And what I've done is I've connected it to two ATEMs. I've got my pro and my ISO. It's also connected to my home automation system so I can control the lights in here and it's connect connected to the video hub. So I can make buttons that will tell the video hub to switch sources. So if you look at like main camera, all that one does is it runs a macro on the ATEM, which it actually like disables um, the keys and stuff like that and switches back to that angle. But then this one, for example, first it tells the video hub to route the Mars 300 to input four, taking over where the hyperdeck and then 700 milliseconds later switches to that camera angle in the ATEM. You can also have buttons that, um, I think these are some of my older ones. Yeah, here we go. This one should, no, I'll just have to make one. So if you wanted to make a new button to control both ATEMs, you would just say, um, you can say ATEM set input on program on this ATEM. Okay. We're going to set that to main. And then we're also going to, uh, ATEM mini pro set input on the other ATEM to something else. And you can see the sources are different here because they're two different ATEMs. 
So yeah, absolutely. The trick is that you using companion, you get more flexibility and then this will connect over the network to both ATEMs. And I'm running companion on a Raspberry Pi, but you can also run it on your computer as long as your computer is also then on, on the network. That worked. Bart says, haven't done those tests on that switcher, but I hope so. Hope to soon. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, we were chatting the other day about HDMI switchers that are trying to see if they're actually seamless switchers or not. So I have some ideas for how to test that. I see on your screen the same problem with bitrate indication, 0.13 megabits a second that I have two from time to time. Oh, I didn't even notice that. That's bad. Does the stream look okay? Yeah, it looks okay to me. And YouTube is, oh, what is going on? I'm getting a lot of warnings in YouTube right now. This is really bizarre. I didn't even notice that. Check this out. This is my YouTube console and it's telling me like streams bitrate 32 megabits a second, 35. And then it went back to normal here. And like it looks fine now, but yeah, my ATEM is saying 0.13, which it doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, but it looks fine in the little preview window. I have zero idea what that is going on. What is going on with that? I have no idea at all. Um, yeah, weird. Okay. Some sort of little bug. Is it is there a possibility of using the Stream Deck to control Mac volume? I have the touch bar and would love to have buttons to adjust volume like the old days. Um, yes. So if your Stream Deck is plugged into your computer rather than into a Raspberry Pi like I have, then you can either use Stream Deck's features, like Elgato's features with their app, where you can control all sorts of stuff on your laptop. I don't know if Companion can do that. I don't. I don't think it can. I don't think you're if you're using companion. So someone mentioned there's a way to. Uh, someone mentioned that there's a way to use companion with the Elgato software. So it, like only some of the buttons swap out. Like the way I have it set up, companion completely takes over the Stream Deck, which is actually fine for me because I don't care about using the other ones. But you would need to use it in that like hybrid mode. So if anybody has information about that, I bet John Barker does. Um, that would be how I would do this. He probably has a video about it. Go check out his channel. It's here to record. Have you combined the ATEM TBS and the ATEM Mini Pro camera inputs on the Video Hub? So I'm actually still not using the Television Studio because it's just so picky about um, frame rates where everything has to match, and it's annoying frankly, and it doesn't have enough of the other features where I didn't think it was worth it to, to hook it up to this setup. It's also very loud. And you may notice that the audio in here is actually back to passable today. So the I swapped out the fans in the video hub and it's barely audible now. I can still hear it a little bit, but it's not really concerning anymore. The TV studio, even though I swapped out the fans, it was still very loud and I, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, use it. I need to just sell it at this point. The But what I do have is I do have a second ATEM on the table over there still, and I'm testing out that setup where I have one over here, one over there, and I can route all my cameras to that ATEM if I want to, and then switch the show and stream from over there, or I can feed that one in over here if I want to, so lots of options. But, yep, not using the television studio. When I get videos from clients to play on the stream, I get tons of different files, resolutions, and codecs, which I convert it to. If you're using a HyperDeck, then I would just convert everything to ProRes 422, make it easy, and uh, run everything through any of those 
any of those converter programs like uh, Adobe Media Encoder or FFmpeg, make them all the same format. But otherwise, if you're using some other app to play it, it may not matter that they're different formats as long as the app can play it. So it depends on how what playout software or hardware you're using. Have you found a way to rack mount the ATEM Mini other than Velcros, possibly a frame to hug it? I have not. I haven't found a need to rack mount it yet. I would actually probably want it to be in a drawer that could pull out if I did. Sounds like a fun thing to 3D print though, a little a little one U rack that you can pull the ATEM out. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I don't know. I probably won't go anywhere near that project for um a long time because I don't I'm not I don't want it in the rack in this setup like I have my my rack is full now I've got the uh, the patch things I've got I guess like it could fit up here if I move that over there I could put it there but I've also got the TV and the Raspberry Pi behind that and there's the video hub and there's that and then I didn't want this monitor to be any higher so I chopped off to you so yeah, I probably won't, probably won't uh, go anywhere near that. But hey, join the forums, the uh, live video, let me drop a link, forum.livevideotech.today. Join the forums because there are people um, who are trying this stuff out. So, and it's a great place to go and post, post photos and search to see if anybody else is trying that. Yeah, heat could be an issue in rack mounting. You would definitely want to make sure that that is. That's why I was suggesting like you probably want to pull it out just so that then the the fans bent sideways that are out of the rack at that point. Okay. Oh, now I'm getting way behind on the chat. Are you saying that you can use OBS just to create graphics and input as HDMI into the ATEM Mini? Yes, exactly. So that's. That's what um, that's what I was suggesting, or that's what uh, the, the comment was about of using OBS as just a graphics generator, and then you can output from OBS over HDMI into the ATEM as one of the inputs. So then whatever you do in OBS just shows up on one of the little sources in the ATEM, and that way there's no like video data going through OBS. It's just the the graphic sources. Isn't it time for a new A10 Mini, or is Blackmagic having too much Christmas food? <laughs> it is. It sure seems like it's time, um, but who knows? Because they don't they don't really worry about launching those at any of the major events anymore because they're not in person anyway. So they've just making been making their own events at their own schedule, and who knows? But yes, I agree. It's about time for the perfect A10 Mini Pro Plus or whatever I said. I don't remember what I called it. This is a good question that I don't know the answer to. In regards to music royalties for streaming, is there any place to go for real music versus royalty-free homemade tracks? I, I guess I, I guess if you mean real music, you mean music on labels that are popular, well-known labels. I don't know. I, um, uh, I've just I use those like stock music websites. The one I really like right now is Artlist. I think I have a link to it down below, and. The reason I've been using that one, I switched to that one recently, was because of their licensing model. Of um, like, all the libraries have good stuff. They're all you know decent selection of tracks, and uh, but the way Artlist does their licensing, um, I like it a lot. So it's if you download a track while you have an active subscription, you get the license to use that track forever on anything. Some of the other ones are like you can only use tracks. If you are currently paying for a subscription, some of them make you limit what channels you can put them on and you have to document or can only put it on one YouTube channel, for example. And somehow Artlist has the most flexible one. So I thought that was um, that was interesting. And that is why I ended up using that so I can use it on different uh, different shows. Let me make sure that link is it's not in this video. It's in all of my other videos that have music. And uh, I will go ahead and dig up the link, though. 
So when I do, when I do videos with music, then I link to what music service I used um, to get it. Except on my last video, of course, because I uh, messed up. Okay, I know this one has it. There we go. If you use this link, then you get two months free. And it helps me out as well. Cool. You should buy some white printing material. Yes, I do. I sure do have some white printing material. This was a little uh, SD card USB holder thing that I made. And of course, I got some white plastic. And I just see a super chat that came in and my lights turned green. Super chat. Thank you very much, Jax. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, a lot of chat today. This is great. I'm going to scroll back up to where I was and try to get to these questions. Can you play animated overlays and stinger transitions in your stream via OBS? If so, what's the advantage of the HyperDeck versus OBS? Yeah, you totally can. And um, honestly, it's a lot more flexible doing it in OBS just because you have a lot more different ways to uh, create graphics and load in videos and formats are less picky and all that stuff. The advantage of the HyperDeck Mini, though, is that it can send, the ATEM can send control commands to the hyperdeck. So when you switch to an angle, for example, the um, when you switch to the angle of the input that the hyperdeck is running in on, that can also then send a command to the hyperdeck to play. So you can have your video queued up, and then when you switch to that angle, it'll just start rolling automatically. And uh, that is super cool because it means that it's just a lot easier to automate. Whereas in OBS, you're going to have to then do some more tricks to get the timing to work out. It's, it's absolutely doable, but it will just be more work. I would say that's the advantage. I do a lot of live events to an audience. How do you use multi-view and stream to TVs at the same time? Yeah, if you need the multi-view, that's that eats up your HDMI out, and then your only other option is to use the streaming output, the Ethernet output. So that's exactly what the streaming bridge is for. The downside, of course, is it will add a slight delay, but it's probably fine for probably fine for um, if you are streaming to TVs where you don't need it to be behind the performers. Um, but that's probably what I would what I would do. The streaming streaming bridge takes um, you put it on your network and then your a time will stream your pro or ISO will be able to stream instead of to YouTube to the streaming bridge. Of course, if you also need to stream to YouTube, then you're kind of in trouble. And now you got to go through more hoops of, of setting more things up. Okay. And again, I'm skipping through these. If I uh, don't see my, my at Aaron Parecki. Bart asks, what control over your Blackmagic Pocket Camera do you have from the ATEM? Assuming it's just start and stop and image controls, not menu controls like formatting cards. Yes, that is true. It is. Uh, it can start recording in it. It can control color grading, focus, aperture, ISO, things like that. And uh, But it's not like, yeah, you don't get menu control. So I do have mine rigged up which I should be able to control. Well, actually, it's rigged up to that other ATEM right now. So I can control it from that ATEM. Um, we'll see how much I actually end up using that. I have it over on that desk now. It's going to be the main camera for the table. And we'll see how much I end up using the actual like ATEM's control over it versus just my phone over Bluetooth. Frankly, the phones, my phone's Bluetooth app has done a pretty good job of being able to control it anyway. So I might just stick with that and never actually bother um, trying to trying to bring it up to the ATEM and using that. John asks, how much confidence does it take to spray paint the front cover of a brand new video hub? 
Yeah, excellent question. Um, a lot. So I just realized that my uh, camera, my little side camera battery died. So let's see if I can swap that out. I didn't wire up power to it today. But yeah, the you may have noticed that it took me a couple of weeks after having it before I was willing to paint it. So that is one thing to keep in mind. But this is what we're talking about here. This is the the outside is this, you know, Star Trek case cage thing, which whatever, it's like $60. So I don't really care about painting it. Uh, this one, same idea, you know, this is or this. Oops, you can't see it. The breakout panel, that's cheap. So whatever. These little panels are cheap. Uh, and then they start getting more and more expensive. So the Hyperdeck was old enough that I didn't care about painting it because it was already way out of warranty. Same with this. I've had this for like five years and not a big deal. Also, this one was super easy because the front plate just comes right off and the, all the electronics have nothing to do with the front plate. So super easy one to paint. The Video Hub, I held off on it because I was like, this is new. It's still under warranty. And if I do this, uh, they're probably not going to be appreciate that very much if I ever have to send it back to them to get it fixed. So I waited until I was sure that it was going to work in this studio and work for my workflow. And I had it all hooked up. I've used it for a couple weeks now. And um, it is, it's is—it's been great. It's solved a lot, of the, a lot of the problems I've been having. And then I was like, OK, we're going to do it. And the before I actually went and did it, I waited until I got the fan replacement in, so I only had to take it apart once. And then the fan replacement is non-destructive, so I can actually go and undo that if I need to. The painting is not, is, is destructive, right? So I was only going to paint it if I could easily take everything apart to remove all the electronics so I didn't have to cover anything up and risk messing with the electronics. And it turns out that it actually was pretty straightforward to take apart. I took some video of it, so I'll put that in my eventual studio tour, but the process of, process of that was like, take off the case, take off the front plate, disconnect the panel. And then the only thing that didn't come off was the little knob. And I'm a little bit upset now that I painted the Hyperdeck one. I wish I had left this one black because this one, I don't actually know how it pulls out. It's really interesting. It's connected with a, it's not wired. It's, uh, it's like a, it's a rotary encoder using like magnets. So there is no electrical connection between the knob and the thing behind it. So the knob is part of the panel and I couldn't figure out how to actually remove the knob either. So I had to tape that up with painter's tape and it's almost perfect, almost perfect. And yeah, I was definitely a little bit nervous about doing that. So I spent some time waiting to make that decision. Oh, here we go. Super chat with a question. Every time I stream, I have to restart the modem router ATEM. If not, If not to upstream, everything manual IP normally, oh, to point two upstream. I'm still on point one three apparently, even though I do not believe it. Uh, normally six up, no problem. Computer is 45 up. I would, yeah. So thinking through the different pieces involved here of what could be the problem, the network gear is probably my most the thing I would blame first here. So the router and the modems and switches and all that, like definitely will have an effect on the quality of, of the stream going through it. So I would start swapping those out and seeing if you get better results from different hardware. So if you can find a different router, try that, see if it works better. But uh, also try like, well, no, everything is well under hundred megabits. So it should, yeah, I would just start swapping those those that network gear out because if you're getting 45 from your computer through the same router, it could just be that it's being weird with certain gear. Um, I have a switch, for example, that I have now um, gotten rid of because it just like suddenly started flaking out on certain uh, with certain devices, and I was just like, I, you know, I don't need this in my life. And uh, yeah, thanks for the super chat. Oh, this wasn't a question. Can and do you write macros for the ATEM Mini incorporating the video hub? Does it allow you to switch cameras with the macro? 
Okay, yeah, so the ATEM Mini does not control the Video Hub, but the Video Hub does have network control. So I control them both through Companion. So in Companion, I can make a button for my Stream Deck that does a command to the Video Hub and then a command to the ATEM. And because the Video Hub is not a seamless switcher, it is, it's, um, it's not like an ATEM where the switch is instant. It'll take a second for the video to like sync back up to the source and destination, especially if you're if you've got any HDMI mixed in there with converters like I do, there's a delay there. So I have in companion, the macro is, or not macro, the, the button is like this one. You can see it's got switch on the video hub, wait for almost a second, and then switch on the ATEM because it wouldn't be an actual uh, instant it's not going to work if I just immediately cut over. Using the bridge direct from UTP, what's UTP? UTP connect bridge to ATEM is latency so low that it becomes usable as a live monitoring system. I don't know what UTP connect is. Uh, if you're talking about the streaming bridge, no, it's it's not quite. It's not real time. It's like half a second to a second delay, uh, depending on different things. So I wouldn't, it's, it's fast enough that like, honestly, it's, it's fast enough for most things. And I even did that, um, video call with photo Joseph, where I was joining him by sending from my studio to his streaming bridge. And what you were seeing on that stream was I was delayed by whatever the streaming bridge delay was even when we were talking, having a conversation, but it actually was so low that it wasn't really noticeable. So it's probably fine, but if you need to see actual real time, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to go through the streaming bridge. The chat that I'm using for this stream is an extension that I wrote, browser extension for Chrome. And that one I do believe is linked down below. So go take a look at that. And I do have a video about it as well. And I recently added some features to the extension to let me customize the colors. So if you download it, you can change the color of the names that appear here and, uh, and things like that. This stream, this is the Lumix G7. I think I linked to that down below as well. And let me just grab the link again. Yep, the camera I'm using for this live stream is the Lumix G7. I'm a big fan of it because of its price. It is affordable. It's $500 with the, with a lens and it gets the job done. It is by no means the best camera out there, but the quality is totally fine and um, you're going to get more you're going to get better results by spending more money elsewhere before you spend more money on a camera. So that is why I use this camera here. Do you know of any fixes for SSD recordings after the 853 update? Disk turns yellow after hitting record. Interesting. Um, I know that it still just doesn't work with certain drives, so hopefully we'll keep seeing firmware updates for it. It is interesting. It's been a while since we've had a firmware update, actually, now that I think about it. I wonder if that means they're working on a new ATEM. But yeah, I think it's always going to be the case that it just might not work with certain certain ones. I just bought the Stream Deck. Two words, how you used it with the ATEM Mini Pro, and I guess we have a video about it. You know, I actually don't think I have a video about it, but here to record, John Barker does. So if you search his channel, He's got lots of videos about using the Stream Deck with the ATEM using Companion as the sort of middle piece. Um, at some point, I should do that uh, because that would be nice to have on my channel as well. But he's got he's got good tutorials about setting it up. Paul says, I found some bidirectional 3G converters. You didn't buy them all. Great. Uh, tried using the ATEM Mini to control BMD Studio Micro 4K but it only does frame rate and ISO. Oh, well, I mean, isn't that all that it controls normally? Oh, wait, does, is that, it doesn't do the color correction in that one? I was, mm, yeah, I actually haven't tried it with mine yet. I've only tried 
the black magic. I did I did test. Someone asked about this earlier. Um, if you have if you want to control a black magic camera, Pocket 4K over longer than HDMI can go, you can go from a Mini Pro to a H, H, HDMI to SDI converter, two SDI cables, SDI to HDMI to the camera, and that does actually work. So. That uh, means you can control the Pocket 4K from a Mini over very long distances. Stuart, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. Your Raspberry Pi tutorial was excellent. I can stream from OBS, Wirecast, Teradek, so and other encoders, but the ATEM doesn't. Except it works with StreamBridge. What am I missing? The... What are you missing? It should absolutely work. Um... What could be the problem? Let me think. Probably network settings. So that's probably the problem. I would say, um, oh, the other thing is, so double check that the, first of all, the IP address of the ATEM is on your network properly. Uh, I know the, the it should just do it with, with um, DHCP, but Make sure that's set up right, and then also make sure that the port number for the ATEM is, or for the streaming, for the Raspberry Pi, is in the XML config that you make for the ATEM. So, because it could be that if you don't put a port number in, it's defaulting to a different port than the, than the Raspberry Pi is expecting. So, that's the only thing I can think of. Um, the otherwise, yeah, it totally should. Totally should um, work, especially if you are able to stream from the ATEM to something else and from the other things to the Raspberry Pi. Hopefully that helps. And thanks for the super chat. Ah, that was Colin. It was it was Colin that asked about the Pocket 4K and double converters. Yeah, totally works. Okay. Scrolling back through, where was I? There we go. While you're streaming, what are the live stats that you keep track of? Normally, I try to keep track of the bitrate because it does show me that on the screen here. I can see 0.13, okay. However, I don't know what's up with this because it's definitely not 0.13. And the other one I keep track of is on YouTube Studio where I'm, I'm looking here. I actually leave this playing just so I can see what what you're seeing on YouTube. Uh, of course, it's a little bit delayed, but I don't care. And uh, I keep track of concurrent viewers. I look at the stream health of this, which is now um, complaining at me about sending too much data. So it says I'm sending 30 megabits a second, which I also don't believe. Um, I will say that like YouTube's streaming status of like what it it's expect what what it's getting is not 100% reliable. So I've definitely seen some weird things from it and also it does it complains even when it doesn't need to. Like it complains about when I actually am sending only like 200 kilobytes a second because it's the the loading screen like the countdown screen and it actually works fine. So um yeah, I'm pretty confused about what's going on right now, but it, as long as it's working fine, um that's that's great. Uh, what else do I keep track of? Um, audio. So I can see my audio on, on here. So I'm making sure that I'm sending you audio. Apparently, I did not notice that this one was still on before. And um, I can see that uh, the camera, this camera is sending audio, but it's muted. So that's good. Um, and yeah, it's, it's hard to keep track of when you're the one also on camera. When, when I'm not the one on the camera, if I'm just behind the camera, then it's a lot easier to, to monitor all of that and, and see what's going on and making sure, making sure that it's working. Oh, and then the other part is the chat. So I have, I have the, of course, my chat that I'm using to actually show to you on the screen, which means I'm scrolled up. Like you can see the scroll bar is like midway. So I'm not looking, I can't see the new stuff here. So down here, I also keep this one up so that I can see uh, new comments in case Suddenly, everyone tells me that my audio is that is bad. Then, um, I will see people talking about that in real time down there. 
Um, but yeah, it is a lot to keep track of. They do make a clean switch video hub that can be used that way. Yes, uh, only 12 inputs though. They don't go, their, their bigger ones don't do that. Okay, coming up on the top of the hour. Um, let me see more questions I can get to. Do you use any software for live streaming to YouTube or just direct? I go directly from the A10 Mini Pro directly to YouTube. So that's the one doing the encoding, which normally works uh, better than trying to deal with apps on my computer. Uh, Sony ZV-1 is a good camera. That's my side camera here. However, I will say that thing I don't like about it is that the USB power, uh, it, it doesn't, can't really re be reliably powered over USB. So let me say it that way. The, you need a battery plugged in and then you can plug in USB and then it will sort of use the USB power to keep the battery charged, but still running off of the battery. And it is still possible to have it think the battery is dead and it shuts off. So that happened on the last live stream at that table over there. And Right now it's just on battery only um and i apparently hadn't didn't have a fully charged battery in here earlier but the um the other way to power this is with a dummy battery where you can get a usb powered thing that you stick into the battery slot however the place that they put the tripod screw means you can't um open the battery door when it's on a tripod and there is no little like hole like in normal cameras for the cord to run out of. So most other cameras will have a little hole in the battery slot to run a cord out of. This one does not. So you have to have the battery door open, which means you can't put it on a tripod unless you then also get a cage for it. So it's on a little, uh, I don't know well you can see this, but it's in a little cage and that's how it's on a tripod. So I can open the battery door only because I'm not using their tripod screw. And uh, I have a dummy battery coming tomorrow, so hopefully I will be able to power this thing better for these live streams, because other than that, it's a great camera. Do you have a solution for the chat to not skip questions? Not 100%, no. So it's um, the way that my chat thing works, it turns them green when when I've tapped one, so I can sort of see what what I've tapped, although it gets wrong after an hour or so, I think it starts reusing these little things. So after an hour, then some of the future ones end up turning green already, which is a little bug, which I have no idea how I'm going to fix that. Um, but that's why I also ask you to make sure that you tag my name in the questions so that I can quickly scroll through, look for the orange ones, and then um, look for whether or not they're, they're tapped green, and then get to them. This is an example of one that I did not tap yet, even though it is turned green. So yes, I'm glad. Um, give that a shot. You should be able to at least um, get like a cheap router and test with that and see if it's just, um, just that's the thing that's wrong. Color correction only works with the Ursa Mini. Docs say so. Okay. Well, didn't read the docs before buying. I guess that would be a problem. At least it's documented. Okay, I'm going to go see if there's any others I can get to, and then we're going to wrap this up. What else can I talk about? Can I use the HyperDeck to send an animated logo as overlay of a video stream? You sure can. That's how I do the countdown. So the countdown is a, um, it's a graphic that just has the little circles with a little thing around them. And then the rest of the background is black. So you can key that out. And um, that could be anything, right? I'm, it's not a logo in my case, but you could absolutely do that. It will take up one HDMI input if you're doing just um, the, the Luma key to remove the black. If you want to do a proper key where you can get an alpha layer to get better edges, then you would need to use two of your inputs to do the key that way. Trying to decide on getting a GoPro, do you think it will work? 
you won't be able to use USB-C. No, the GoPro has an HDMI port on it that you can definitely use with the ATEM. I will say GoPro is not my favorite camera to use with this. It's not really meant to be used in that kind of setting. It is definitely meant to be an action camera and you're paying a lot for a lot of features that you would not be using if you're using it with an ATEM. Is there a way to multi-stream without having to pay for a service? Having the Pi streaming bridge push to multiple R RTMPs? Absolutely. Definitely you can use the Pi streaming bridge to do that. Um, actually, Doug Johnson just did a video about this. Let me grab that link. Um, he did that like two days ago. And set up your own RTMP server to re receive and redistribute live video. So this is um, DIY re uh, what do you call it? Redistributing RTMP. Okay, set up your own RTMP server. Set up your own RTMP server. Okay, drop a link to that in the chat. Take a look at that video. Uh, I haven't actually watched it yet, but I'm sure it's a good tutorial. Lynn asks, and thank you for the super chat. Are you having issues with Chromecast not working on your ATM? I'm only getting sound. Yes, the Chromecast only outputs HDCP encrypted video signal always and there you it, it won't fall back into regular mode even on just like its loading screen so the only way to do that is to um only way to use the chromecast with the atem or any any switcher is to run it through an hgcp stripper which is hard to find because they're not exactly legal and you can usually find an hdmi splitter that will strip hgcp uh, I think I linked to one in the Chromecast chat video, so go take a look at that. Um, or I might be able to find it. And that will that will solve it. But it's also like, yeah, here we go. Um, this is a HDMI splitter for Chromecast. There's the link. And uh, that should then, then make it work. Um, I will also say, last week, during the one of my very long live streams, then um, what I did was tested other devices other than a Chromecast to see if there's a better solution. And it turns out that there are a couple of devices that are a little bit cheaper than a Chromecast that do just as good of a job and don't require running it through an HTTP stripper. When you're all you're trying to do is share a browser tab, it's silly to need another device in that chain. So um, I think I am actually still using my Chromecast on here today just because it's already in in the whole cage. But for the future, it's a lot nicer to not to not have to worry about all those extra wires. Can you put the link for the ZB1 dummy battery in the chat? Yes. Let me see if let me see where I have that. Uh, and while I'm digging that up, what else can I talk about? Is it possible to change mic one audio delay via macros? If different cameras had different latency in the ATEM, could it be programmed to set the latency on audio based on which channel? You absolutely can. So you can you can do that just fine. Um, there's the way that I would do that is like anytime I'm trying to make a macro, go through the the, the motions of actually changing the delay while you're recording a macro and seeing what the XML ends up as. And that's gonna be the best way to um, make sure you're, you've got the right XML. It absolutely does work. The one downside I will say is that the, um, when the delay actually switches, you get a little bit of an artifact because you are either like going back or forward in time. So you'll hear a little bit of a faint click and it might be fine. It might be unnoticeable. Um, I guess you might be able to smooth that out with more automation. If you dropped the gain on the channel and then switched the delay and then brought the gain back up really quickly, all within that macro, you could probably remove that little pop. Um, but that's the one thing to keep in mind for that. And uh, yeah, otherwise, otherwise it totally, totally does work. All right. 
Uh, do I use a three and a half millimeter jack on the ATEM for live streaming or do you run mic into an audio interface? I actually run this mic into my camera because that's the easiest way to get it in sync just because it's already in sync by the time the video hits the ATEM. Um, I do use the microphone jack if I'm using a lav mic. I'll usually run the lav mic receiver into the ATEM rather than a camera. Um, and I don't have any audio interfaces here, uh, mostly because this seems to work fine. And I'm not using XLR microphones here. I do have a XLR mic on the table over there with a XLR uh, a zoom recorder. And I have that because that's how I record audio for the edited videos where I record audio onto an SD card separately and then mix it in post. And I do sometimes run that one into, uh, into the ATEM over the mic input. Power brick I use my ZV-1 is the Sony discontinued. That's bizarre. I wonder why. Couldn't you put just the latest answer question green? Since you only go one way, it'll give you a bookmark. Interesting thought. I'll keep that in mind. Um, I wonder if that would solve the sort of reusing the reusing the cells issue. Hm, good thought. Okay. Um, last questions. I have never used the Canon. I haven't used the Canon camera since the Rebel T5i. So I have no idea about the M50. However, G7 is great and I absolutely love it. Okay. I think we are... I think we're about wrapped up here. Um, have you worked out how to connect headphones to the ATEM Mini ISO to monitor your audio? Yes. The way I do that is by running headphones out of the monitor that I'm looking at. So when I'm looking at the multi-view here, my headphones are plugged into this monitor. And that way I can actually listen to it. Pancakes or waffles? Uh, waffles. Waffle everything if you can. That is my opinion on, on waffles. Waffle grilled cheese, for example. Excellent. And John, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. Thank you all for watching. And uh, hello, YouTube Dave. And uh, I'm glad Bart appreciates the answer. Okay, great. Yes, push the like button. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Thank you all for watching. Thanks for hanging out with me every Sunday and just chatting about this stuff for an hour. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. And it's, I have a blast always. And yeah, thanks. Oh, thanks for another super chat. Appreciate it, Randy. And with that, I'm going to say good evening, good morning, and see you all in the next one.